Hi everyone, thank you for coming tonight. Um, I'm Manisha Vergis, I'm the head of the public program here at the AA and I'm delighted to, tonight to introduce Leopold Lambert who will be speaking to us about weaponized architecture towards a revolutionary practice of the discipline. Um, this talk is part of a new lecture series we initiated this term called New Canonical Histories and it um, aims to address the decolonization of knowledge. Um, the series invites architects, artists, historians, um, who through their practice and research um, redefine inherited historical models, giving us tools to not only reimagine our past but also project forwards into the future. And tonight's speaker has been doing exactly that throughout his career to date through investigating the politics of the built environment. Um, so he's been doing this by providing a platform through the bi-monthly magazine, The Funambulist, which he founded in 2015 to give contributors a platform to discuss spatial pers perspectives on anti-colonial, anti-racist, queer, feminist, and disability-related prejudices and struggles. These themes are also reinforced through his own political articles and books. And this research collectively expands, interrogates, and in some cases even rejects the conventional architectural canon. So Leopold trained as an architect and is based in Paris. He was last at the AA, which I thought was much more recently, but it was in December 2017, um, to chair a discussion between um, architect Samane Moafi and uh, geographer Melissa fernandez Araguatia um, on the role of family in shaping space, issues of gender, class, and race, and the lack of specificity to context and social structure that accompanies housing projects in the global south. And both of them were contributors to the Funambulist, which would, made him the perfect chair for this talk. And, um, and we're so excited to have him back here with us. Um, he's the author of three books, Weaponized Architecture, The Impossibility of Innocence, The Corporeal Politics of the Cloth, the Wall, and the Street, and Bulldozer Politics, This Palestinian Ruin as an Israeli Project. His next book is tentatively called States of Emergency, A Spatial History of the French Colonial Continuum. And hopefully we'll hear a bit more about that tonight as he discusses how architects are often complicit in manifesting political power as space. And through that, he's going to question how we can rethink practice to resist this. So please join me in welcoming Leopold back to the AA. Good evening, everyone. A uh, big, big thank you to Manije for uh, uh, both creating this uh, lecture series uh, and uh, for inviting me to it. Um, and um, I was very enthusiastic about about this this uh, this series, and so I sort of decided to play the game of it, which basically meant pretty much uh, uh, trying to to build a presentation from the from the ground up. Uh, and so, as such, I'm, I'm a little bit less confident than I would uh, sort of uh, telling you uh, only about my my current book project or or some things that I'm really that I'm that I really that is much easier to articulate uh, today for me. But I, I really wanted to sort of reflect on on the discipline of architecture uh, itself and uh, understanding the importance of doing so within a, within a, a place like a, a school of architecture. Um, so bear with me if it's if I'm a little bit hesitant at time, and I'm actually going to finish by something I never did before, which is a sort of reading reading a manifesto I wrote an hour ago, <laughs> uh, and uh, and so same thing like bear bear with my style there <laughs> because I'm not a great writer, but I'll, I'll I I did my best on putting that together. Uh, perhaps, perhaps starting with something a little bit easier for me, which is just to introduce myself and introduce my work. Perhaps giving you a, a little bit of a, of an idea where I'm coming from with everything else. Uh, I'm, as uh, Manija said, I am. I'm originally a trained architect, and as such, I, I've been, I've been uh, uh, tasting the delights of uh, design <laughs> in a long time ago, and I, I, uh, and I never really f uh, forget that, even though. Uh, it's been a while since um, since, uh, since I was able to to put that into practice, uh, but that's uh, I still, despite everything that I, despite everything that I say about architecture and it's always problematic uh, dimension. I think I'm very I'm still very much attached to the very idea of design, um, and. Um, and so most of my, my main job now is consists in running this uh, this magazine that comes out every every other month, the Phenomenalist, each time around a, a particular topic uh, that has to do with what I call the politics of space and the bodies and bodies. 
um, with various topics, as you can see. This was like the, the 10 first ones, then the 10, the 10 that followed uh, with, again, um, various topics that uh, range from uh, many, range in many, uh, many uh, geographical uh, scales to, and well, many geographies and many scales from the, from the larger to the smallest. Uh, and then more more recently, we started a, a new uh, a new series in 2019. The sixth issue of 2019s are are um, are more more specifically dedicated to promoting some dimension of political struggle. So the first one, was January February, was about space, and uh, we have at least one contributor in the room. And uh, the second one that will come out. Either tomorrow or Monday is about publishing, and we also have another contributor in the room. <laughs> uh, and uh, and so I'm I'm really I really like this this series of that tries not so much to deconstruct state violence as we are so used to do, but uh, uh, and that I will do tonight. Uh, and uh, but but actually very much trying to to promote some various dimensions of political struggles. Uh, I am also a writer. Uh, Manager was kind enough to mention those three books, and and I think that's that's kind of a little bit more uh, with this cap that I come to you today. Uh, it's usually this one, so it's, it doesn't really distinguish. But uh, and um, and I, I suppose the two the two main geographies, the two main geo geo histories that I'm that I'm particularly involved in uh, are to be found in Palestine and uh, and. Um, and uh, through through various uh, through various analysis and projects and uh, and deconstructing of the the apartheid state uh, through architecture uh, and uh, through this uh, through this work on the French colonial continuum, um, trying to write a book about the, the spatial history of the states of the state of emergency in uh, Algeria. Uh, so in, in Algeria, each time again, like with uh, through through maps, and I'm saying Algeria, it's actually not in Algeria necessarily, but during the Algerian Revolution, both in Algeria and in France. Um, so that's the first geography uh, mobilized in this book. Uh, Kanaki, New Caledonia, which is uh, which is another example of French settler colonialism that uh, you may or may not know. Uh, that is still currently a, a French colony, what I would very much call a, a French colony, where, uh, and uh, I'm particularly looking at the, uh, during the 80s, uh, the, the indigenous Kanak struggle against uh, colonialism. And then in the French banlieue, in the suburbs, uh, in the, and the various uh, apparatuses of, um, of perpetuation of, of French colonial violence uh, through space and architecture. So that leads me to, oops, uh, did I walk on something? Yes, I did. Okay, great. Um, so that leads me to the, to the proper presentation itself uh, in which I propose to look at three somehow banal uh, components of architecture um, and um, that, will, that will be the wall, the corridor, and the key. Uh, and then I will, I will finish with this uh, small manifesto. So starting with a wall, which is probably the one out of the three that I've been spending the most time on. Uh, and obviously, when we think of the wall, uh, we immediately think of uh, the, various, uh, the various border walls of the, of the earth, in particular, the wall uh, as it's been uh, promo uh, promoted during an entire uh, US uh, presidential campaign. But I think before we even uh, before we even look at uh, the, this most extreme manifestation of, of what we call the wall, we can sort of try to go back to we can try to go back to what a wall does and what a wall is, um, and to think of it first and foremost as the crystallization of um, architecture's violence, being meaning um, a sort of physical. Uh, material formation um, that organizes bodies in space, and and so this is this is kind of like the the most obvious form here, almost a, almost a cliche. Uh, but if we go back to the very idea of uh, the very idea of tr of tracing tracing the lines that end up uh, becoming the walls, we can think of it as like the. I mean, 
I don't, I don't know, I don't know whether that's useful or not to 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 think of the sort of uh, of um, to think of it almost chronologically in history, but as as the, the um, agriculture and the, the furrow in particular being the the sort of first uh, materialization of of dividing territories, but which which will end up being the wall. And I always like this story. Uh, I always like this myth of um, of Romulus and Remulus uh, at the formation of Rome, and um, the idea of like um, so you you may or may not remember uh, those two brothers uh, who who uh, sort of decide to create a city and for some kind of weird reason, but I guess there would not be any myth otherwise. Uh, only one can uh, can 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 actually create the city. And um, and so uh, so asking the gods, one one is uh, one thinks. I mean, both of them obviously believe that there is a one chosen by the gods to to create uh, to create the city of Rome, well, to create a city. Uh, and um, and Romulus decides to trace um, to trace a, a trench all around the perimeter of the city that he imagined. Um, uh, he he's about to create, and um, and Remus has this uh, has this uh, sort of like uh, defies defies this first uh, gesture of architecture by jumping over the trench and sort of violating the violating the perimeter of sovereignty that R Romulus had been creating, um, and I think this this uh, this shows well how a trench cannot really do the work that a wall uh, can. Uh, and so, and but the, the law, the legal uh, apparatus that uh, this trench and later the wall uh, implements um, can only work if there is a sort of like a punitive, uh, a punitive apparatus uh, that goes with it. And that's how Romulus kills his brother, kill, kills his brother Remus, for having defying this uh, the, this state of order. And so we can see uh, we can see how uh, obviously. All those lines that are traced by architects, among among others, act symbolically. I mean, you know, we're we're sometimes surrounded by lines and don't really don't necessarily need the sort of physical enforcement of them to do, to act in accordance to them. Uh, just think of being at the airport or in one of those lines with uh, with those straps. Uh, um, and uh, you can go there if you. <laughs> Uh, and uh, but but th this symbolical dimension of the lines is usually is usually not really what what uh, fundamentally uh, enforce enforce them, and uh, most of the time we we do have walls, as in like the physical formation of it, like that prevents that we can sort of explain as as being uh, uh, a physical formation that a body without. With its proper energy, whatever it is, would not really have any any sort of ability to be able to to damage the wall or to move the wall or to go through the wall. And I use I use those uh, stills from the from the the ballet Café Müller by Pina Bausch. Because I don't know if you if you know it. I mean, the stills are can only say so much because it's a, it's a something in movement. But you have those uh, you have those female bodies uh, encountering the wall. I mean, they close their eyes and they're they're sort of Going, go, uh, uh, knocking into the wall in a pretty, in a pretty violent way. Actually, it's very hard to to look at sometimes. But I think I, I I don't know any sort of artistic manifestation more powerful than this one to really talk about what a what a wall in its sort of soul physicality uh, incarnates. And so obviously, uh, uh, obviously, a wall uh, can this this violence. Uh, this sort of material violence that is that is not even political yet. I mean, when we analyze when we analyze it, uh, can embody various political programs uh, from uh, from uh, from some pretty mundane ones to the most uh, to the most violent. But I think it is my contention to say that uh, that all all of them contains this at, at the very least this material violence that is in, then instrumentalized politically. And so that's that's also my my. Uh, that's also why, uh, after all those years, I'm still very much uh, uh, enjoying the fact that the, the, the editorial project is called the Phenomenalist. The Phenomenalist being an, uh, another word for tightrope walker, 
and um, and so those lines with those lines very much uh, organizing the world and organizing bodies in space I think the, the bodies the bodies that walk on the line are definitely not liberated from the line far from it because they they're definitely contained within those few few centimeters uh, uh, um, uh, w walking on them but somehow by being on neither side uh, on neither side they there's they subvert uh, this uh, this order that the line contains so to me that's always a, a very joyful figure of, of subversion um, but as I said, I just talked about a few centimeters of the lines, and obviously, in a in a sort of uh, in a sort of mathematical, uh, in a sort of geometrical uh, uh, definition, a, a line doesn't have any thickness. And I think that's that's something that I've been very early on quite interested in because um, obviously, when the when the line turns into a wall, the wall uh, itself uh, embodies a thickness. Um, and uh, and sometimes the thickness is just uh, the, as I said a few centimeters of the of the Berlin Wall uh, on which someone can walk and we saw we saw when the wall fell that it's, it was m maybe much less about the wall falling and people being able to go from one side to the other than to actually sit on the, I mean the, the most powerful symbol of this of the wall being vanquished was people being able to sit and walk on, walk on it. But then sometimes uh, the thickness, when it comes to border walls, uh, we can see how, how the thickness is, uh, 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 increases and then we, we sort of force to wonder what kind of legal regime is embodied uh, within the thickness. And I think at first it was very tempting, when I, when, I, when I say at first, I mean when I first encountered this idea, it was very tempting to think that uh, a little bit too, too much like a title of walker, that the, the thickness was this very liberating, liberated world uh, where um, uh, that the, the law and the sort of architectural scheme could not really uh, uh, think in advance, could not really convince, but very quickly I realized that in, it was indeed maybe the, the world that the law could not conceive and as such could, could easily become uh, the, the space of uh, total rightlessness. And I, 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 I think this example of um, of 12 Eritrean uh, people trying to cross from the from from Egypt to Israel um, and being trapped for over a week in 2012 in the thickness between those two between between the the Egyptian sort of materialization of the border and the Israeli one and receiving receiving close to no aid whatsoever was uh, to me a very potent symbol of how of the absolute rightlessness. Of the of the thickness of the line, and that leads me to uh, so that leads me to uh, how we can conceptualize this uh, this uh, particular space between two walls, which is the space of the corridor. That's why you do chapters. <laughs> um, and so the space of the corridor is quite interesting also because it is an architectural invention, uh, very much so, uh, without, without wanting necessarily to, uh, to make it a Western, uh, a Western invention because I think that would be uh, profoundly inaccurate, but to t to t talking, talking about it within the Western realms, I think we can see how we went from one paradigm uh, from one paradigm where uh, a corridor would would have no use whatsoever, to um, to the colonial to the paradigm of the colonial uh, and bourgeois uh, residency, where the corridor quickly become a space for the servants to be able to operate within the house without being really seen and and to operate almost from within the walls, which I. So we can already see how the creator has a sort of political uh, implication to it, and then obviously, uh, obviously, uh, pushed to its extreme, the creator is a is a very convenient way to organize a particular political programs, such as the psychiatric hospital or the prison, um, and uh, and it's it it very much uh, regulates um, uh, regulates this or this political organization. Um, but I think what I found the most Powerful in this, uh, in looking at this particular typology, uh, was the work of Temple Grandin that you may or may not know, uh, who's a doctor um, uh, teaching at University of Colorado, 
and uh, who, um, thanks to her autistic condition, uh, um, says that she, she is able to, to be much more uh, understanding the behavior of cattle when confronted to the sort of imminent death of the, of the slaughterhouses. And as such, she designed, um, and in the most sort of architectural way, as you can see, uh, she designed an apparatus that would co that consists in leading uh, leading cattle to their unavoidable death without without them being um, being too stressed and understanding too much what uh, what is about to happen. Uh, so I think that's that's um, extremely expressive when we when we come to talk about the corridor and the corridor having the function. Um, you know, I was talking architecture as a discipline that organizes bodies in space. Obviously, the corridor could could difficultly could could barely be more expressive in that in trying to lead uh, usually to lead bodies from a point A to a point B and a point B, a point B to a point A. But many corridors also are only able to lead from point A to point B. Uh, B in that case being the unavoid, unavoidable industrial death of the animal. And without making too much of a of a literal uh, of a literal connection, uh, but but noticing how uh, noticing how many corridors, as I say, are being used uh, for the capacity to to drive uh, bodies, to organize bodies in space through uh, following lines, and sometimes only from A to B. Uh, I cannot make I, I cannot I cannot not make the connection with uh, the the numerous corridors of the of the apartheid state in Palestine. And weirdly, I started with a wall and then I sort of stretched, stretched the width to obtain the corridor, but if, if somehow we sort of go back to, um, uh, we, we re-restrain the width, the, width the, the width of the corridor, um, uh, and um, what, what this whole width, uh, uh, what this whole thickness of the line sort of makes me go to is the notion of in in so the fact of being walled off, uh, and in particular through this uh, East Euro Eastern European um, uh, myth of uh, of the uh, Mason Manuel, who uh, um, as a as in many myths, something uh, deeply fucked up happens, where he needs to he needs to bury his own uh, his own wife in the in the monastery that he's designing in order for the monastery to to stay to stay uh, to stand still, and and so he is and and the, the screams. I mean, it depends on the version because it's a myth, so there's not obviously there's not like a, a one version. But I always feel this version of the text with. Uh, with a woman being being uh, buried in the wall, and the sort of very expressive, um, the very expressive uh, dimension of it is is particularly um, strong in term in architectural terms. With the wall squeezes the heart. Um, and um, and so in Murament drives me to the third object of uh, the third component, the third architectural component of, uh, of this presentation, which is a key. Um, as as in, in murmurment and, uh, and uh, imprisonment is, uh, in my opinion, comparable for, for that matter. Um, and so, change those chapter. Sorry. And um, and I'm trying to again. I mean, I mean, just like for the wall and the corridor, I'm trying to sort of go back to the most basic dimension of what a what a key what a key is. And I and I and I think of. I mean, I I mean, obviously, to to go to the key, we need to the, we need to go to the door first, and to to analyze how a door is pretty much a wall uh, that allows uh, the porosity of this wall to be to be operable. But then a door rarely comes without its key, so I, uh, I'm, I'm particularly interested in, in looking at it, and uh, and I sort of promised myself that I will, I will use this uh, this uh, Belgium uh, comic book that you, so for the, some of you might be quite familiar with, uh, that actually is not is not really something that I, 
is not even something I found myself, but just to show you how how sometimes uh, silly things like that can be can be uh, uh, can uh, can be operative philosophically. This is this is actually a strip that uh, uh, Bruno Latour uses uh, to explain uh, the sort of technical apparatus at the door, uh, the do in, in which the door consists, but not in not in a very political. Um, not in a very political manner, but so to sort of appropriate this for myself, um, and I need to I need to go to a slide that I often use, which is a, a film by Ray Anderson, We the Living, um, to perhaps um, before going to the key to to explain a little bit more about how um, I perceive the inherent. Uh, political violence of architecture through this time an example that does not even require a wall to to be operative um, so uh, a sort of small shelter a small roof a small shed in a in a very uh, in a very heavy rain and um, and we can see how this uh, how this uh, space have already how this architecture has already reached the sort of critical point where uh, the amount of bodies it can it can host in and uh, and the sort of protection that it uh, that is its function uh, reaches this uh, critical condition where if an additional body would come to would come to seek shelter under this roof uh, this this additional body would be likely to be excluded or or there would be a conflict between bodies to 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 know which which one are gets to stay so to speak so with the presence of this architecture, or in a sudden, we are in a condition where uh, some bodies get um, have, have a social status where they get protected by architecture, and some bodies do not. Uh, and architecture does that because uh, without without the shed, then everybody's in the rain, and, and it's uh, it's a different condition. So I think what I'm trying to say is also when we create a wall or when we create a roof, we create both sides of it. We create the side that is protected in that case and the side that is excluded from it. And here I'm sort of using the most sort of mundane and, and somehow not too, not too crucial uh, dimension of it, just to explain it uh, first. But obviously we realize that most of the walls that surround us do not really materialize an order in which uh, some people get to be protected because they were here first. And some people get to be excluded because you know they came a little bit too late. But most of the walls that surround us very much uh, crystallize other political order of um, uh, and m and many of them the particular order of private property. Um, and uh, and that's where the key the key come in obviously because in this in this in this condition you don't really need a key whereas in this condition you do need a key. And the key is very much the object that. Um, the object in which is contained this protocol of who gets to be who gets to be uh, sort of the, the served by architecture and who gets to be excluded by it, uh, and and there's something almost ceremonially charged in in giving a key this way to to the bodies that are deemed politically to deserve to deserve it. Um, Quite jumping here, sorry. Uh, but I think what I, what I find particularly interesting as well is how that being said, and and private private property being sort of put as a, as an existing system that the, the key sort of very much uh, uh, um, express. Uh, uh, we can see as well. I mean, I th and you'll see in just a minute why why this comes in uh, as well in at this moment of my research, but. Um, we can see as well how there are other protocols that all in a sudden declare the key as completely obsolete um, uh, for by, by various forces of uh, um, um, manifesting state violence. Uh, and I, 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 found, I found this moment of the, of the 2013 sort of shutdown of the entire city of, of, of Boston, sorry, uh, uh, when uh, after the, the attacks of the marathon, particularly interesting architecturally in how all of a sudden everybody who sort of always uh, always considers themselves as being protected by architecture, having the keys of their own houses, 
uh, are being ordered to stay within their house and, and the walls the walls that were once perceived as being um, perceived as being uh, protective of themselves are, are walls that becomes uh, 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 walls that prevent any escape from from them and um, and in my, in my own current research about the, the French uh, state of emergency, I think the, the most the most um, the most extreme forms forms of violence that this state of emergency allowed were much less so the, the deployment. Uh, I mean, here it's in the U.S. of course, but the deployment of military in the streets of big cities of France, and, and much more the invisibilized and the, so the very spectacular dimension of things, the ones that you may you may have seen yourself. Uh, and, and quite on the opposite, the most extreme forms were to be found in the invisibilized um, uh, housing of, uh, of the many, the thousands of people who were, uh, who were erroneously suspected of, uh, of any criminal activity and who were, who were at 99% uh, Muslim. Um, and, uh, and I see in those, I see in those destroy um, in those destroy uh, doors, the, um, the manifestation that the, the, the colonial state in this in this uh, in this example uh, is also able to make the key uh, become obsolete when when it decided to unleash its violence on a particular particular people. <laughs> Sorry. So that leads me to the part that, as you can see, I'm pretty nervous because I, 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 I wanted, as you can see, I'm pretty nervous. <laughs> and now I'm even more so because I'm, I'm uh, reaching, I'm reaching the, the, the manifesto that I told you that I was, uh, I was uh, nervous about. So, but this time, I, that's, this is also why I wrote it this time for once and uh, therefore I'll be able to and, and uh, apparently leave a lot of time for, for the conversations that follow, so that's perfect. All right. When they'll come to us to design and optimize their prisons, or even lure us into thinking that we could somehow make better conditions of life for those who have been forcefully surrounded by walls, we, we will actively non-practice architecture in telling them that we'll only sleep when we will have abolished all prisons. When they'll come to us saying that we need, we need to use our skills as architects to participate to transform the deadly colonial border industrial complex to make it more humane, we will instead use our skills to make evident all the ways through which architecture con constitutes one of the most effective weapons of this complex. When they'll come to us with manuals of how to unfold deadly police and military violence on the bodies explained through an architectural language, we will retaliate with the same language to describe to doulas how women who have been forcefully surrounded by walls can safely give birth in an environment of death. When they'll come to us with their grants, awards, and cultural capital for fetishizing and depoliticizing the many proletarian self-built neighborhoods of the world, we will talk to them about the Algerian shanty towns of Paris during the revolution, or the Palestinian refugee camp of the West Bank and Gaza, show them how architecture can be a weapon against state violence as long as architects accept not to be a part of it. When they'll come to us to be the name and face of neo-colonial project, another operation of dispossession, displacement, and destructions disguised behind words such as renovation, rehabilitation, or revitalization, we will, we will tell them that we refuse to be a part of their schemes, that we boycott them. When they'll come to us and explain that the predatory actions of the males of our offices are not as terrifying and traumatizing as they actually are, that these are individuals' misbehaviors and not structures of power, or that we have simply invented the very existence of this action, we will deafen them with the sound of our voices and topple the grand effigies to the ground. When they'll come to us telling us that the exploitative conditions of the workers in charge of building the grand dream we've been trained to imagine are not our own responsibility, 
we will descend our ivory tower and humble, the, humble ourselves, learning the craft and efforts that such construction necessitate. When they'll come to us, telling us that everyone takes their part in developing the city, that there is no alternative, that neighborhoods are meant to, are meant to see their residents change, that we are not responsible, we will, call, we will call out their speculative and raci racist and classist project and turn the law against them to manifest the right, for, the right to housing for all. When they'll come to us asking us to, bu asking us to build in occupied territory and tell us that history books will only retain the quality of our design, not the violation of international legislation those constitute, we will instead build schools and cultural buildings in the camps of those who were made refugees for lies by them. When they'll come to us, telling us that the wall is an architecture of security deployed against those we terrorize, calling them terrorists, we, we will reply that the wall is an architecture of apartheid we, and we will take our part of the imaginative efforts that envision a future when they no longer hold any dominant power. When they'll come to us to design architecture for and by the white cis male able bourgeois bodies of the world, we will instead conceive boundless worlds that refuse to presume what a body is and can do we will talk to them about the joy of intensively living as a body rather than being contained into one. Like Aimé Césaire, we will stare at them and tell them, blue-eyed architect, I defy you. Rook wronged you, during what night did you, ex did you exchange compass for dagger? And then, more calmly, like Madeleine Gaines, we will say, all men are sisters. And I will end with this, uh, poem by Madeleine Gibbs that is my favorite poem. There simply could not have been a woman who would have said, left side, right side, then stuck to it. For a woman, it is a question of at least seven sides, at least one for every you. Such subtlety contributes to the, sol to the subtle difference. One thing men haven't realized is that unlike them, all men are mortal, women do not die. This makes all the difference, although some women, having been browbeaten by sheer syllogistic silog brown, have at time pretended. Most women do not look like themselves, although many women do assume the form of women, some are men, other gas and electricity, and still others are indistinguishable, ah, every time, <laughs> indistinguishable, sorry. Often being constructed of living material, women are a volatile force in society, and as such, dangerous. Thank, Thank you very much. <laughs>
I think it was more uh, maybe something that I'm able to more uh, to articulate a little bit more is how to completely not completely actually never completely but to to deliberately exit the discipline itself and to very much go uh, looking at um, at um, at works that have so much to do with uh, with with what it is we are responsible as architects for and um, and so going going to speak to people who've been thinking of uh, the political dimension of law, the, who've been doing some work on the, in gender and feminist studies, in uh, postcolonial studies, uh, and to go to go at it in a very uh, um, forgetting somehow to that uh, I mean forgetting a little bit the sort of uh, uh, positions that architects usually occupy, which is usually uh, quite literally a sort of dominant position. I mean, looking down at, at plants, looking down at the world this way and, their, and its lines. And, but also not really forgetting that we're, we are, uh, for worse or better, for the worse or the better, uh, we, are, we are spatial, spatial, not even thinkers, but people who see the world spatially. And this is something that we sort of take for granted without realizing that many other disciplines don't see it this way. Don't so the the sort of the sort of um, um, the intention between between the magazine, for example, was very much to be able to bridge uh, to 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 from the world of architecture to very much get all those voices who may have never said anything about architecture proper, but who. who define uh, other uh, incredibly helpful and useful dimension that that resonates with it, but also to, to give this spatial perspective to many uh, political struggles that uh, uh, did not necessarily think of it before. Thanks, that was a, a really fascinating answer to, I, um, to a question that I'm sure there are plenty more of <laughs> in the audience. Um, can we turn the lights on as well? Yeah. Thank you very much. The, the manifesto is maybe by the sort of way it's written, maybe linguistically, it's, it's very reactionary by, by just you post a situation and then a reaction. Do you think that if you would write it or if you would consider something that is only propositional, would it be possible or would it actually kind of flip things around completely or is it just another way of looking at things? Um. I think I, um, as much as I agree with you, it is it is very much a reaction each time. Um, I think for me that's the only sort of within the sort of political struggle in which I, uh, for which I stand in solidarity, I and and to which I'm sometimes part of, is the uh, there needs to be this sort of world this this. Uh, dismantlement uh, that is um, uh, that needs to happen but I think the risk would be to uh, as I said earlier uh, with what we're trying to do this year with the magazine the risk would be to only uh, uh, dedicate all our efforts in in sort of showing how this violence operates because it is a very it is a much easier exercise to to then to to very much promote various uh, um, uh, various things that are being proposed against it, uh, and, and when I say proposed, I don't necessarily mean as a replacement. I mean, for me, it's not. It's much less a, a matter of replacing a system by a system than being being always fighting the the violence of it. Uh, and so, so that's why this year we're trying very much to focus on on this uh, on various dimension of these reactions, indeed. But I think I think this is not. Uh, I, d I don't um, uh, um, I don't I don't really conceive uh, with this particular agenda I don't particularly conceive any any sort of proposition that would not come first from a, from a, an analysis of, of what what surrounds us and an outrage of at what's around us Hi, thanks Leopold. Um, 
Here. Thanks. <laughs> um, I have two things. The first one is a short comment, and the second one is the question. The first one is when you talk about the wall, I can't help but thinking about the Passe Muraille, um, mm. which, for those who don't know, is the kind of um, French literature canon, <laughs> I'd say. Um, about the wall crossing wall, uh, a man with the kind of magical power of being able to cross and go through walls. Um, so that's that's one thing that I can't help thinking about. I don't know how it articulates. But um, the second one is a question. So your manifesto is quite powerful um, for several reasons, but it it kind of tends to, um, for me, go from the political to the ethical. And Manijay mentioned the, the word ethics. And I was wondering first, you know, who is that we that we were talking about? So are you kind of asking all architects to kind of sign up to your manifesto? And in that sense, um, do you think then that the prof profession should go aim for a kind of ethical, um, well, not manifesto, but being kind of ethically uh, regulated just like the, the uh, medical profession is, for instance. Is mm. there a need for an ethic, ethical framework in architecture? Um, so when it comes to the Pass Muraille, I think uh, it's very clear that it's a key, basically. It's like whoever owns a key has the ability to go through walls. And I think, uh, the, I mean, to go back to a sort of canonical uh, text in relation to that would be to go back to, to a Weizmann Holland and uh, his his interview of, uh, of this uh, brigadier general of the Israeli army telling that he doesn't really care about the fact that there is, there's going to be like this huge territorial wall set up as long as he's able to go through with his, with his troops uh, and to, to intervene in the West Bank and then retrieve, retrieve itself. So I think that's very much what the key is trying to epitomize, the fact that uh, some bodies have the ability to go through walls and some do not. And, and obviously the prison is the most obvious example of that, an extreme, extremely violent example of that. Uh, when it comes to ethics, um, it's, it's, um, for me, ethics is a, is a, is a very valid uh, uh, principle, but it is, um, I, I absolutely separate it from the world of, uh, of the moral. So I don't, I don't necessarily presume that uh, in any given group of people, uh, including an entire profession, uh, people would sort of have uh, as, would have simi similar premises about how to perceive both the world and their perception enough to to determine a, um, a, an entire an entire ethical system. I mean, there might be if if they're able to do so. Then, you know, I mean, that's what Raphael Sperry and the the architect designers planners for social responsibility have been doing. They've been they've been pushing uh, in the U.S. and Canada for. Uh, uh, for either architects to take a pledge or the, or the sort of national order of architects to uh, say that architects will, will never design uh, con con confinement cells and uh, execution chambers. Uh, and, and I very much, I mean, I, I, I comment that so much that I wanted to integrate it here. But I also think for me the sort of the, um, and this might be an ethical thing. I mean, because we maybe we all agree that we shouldn't, we don't want to do that. But then I would go further and say, why? What about banks? What about factories? What about uh, what about condominium? Like, uh, I think there's many many things that I would like to add to that pledge that do not necessarily be um, every, everybody's sort of uh, part of everybody's ethical system. But that's what that's where politics comes in, and this this is what makes me understand that not everybody would stand in the same position, but, but then considering those who do not uh, think of that as political uh, adversaries. And uh, um, so I don't, I don't personally, I mean, this we is not a we as a, is not a corporate is we. It's not an uh, we architects, it's just, uh, it's just uh, um, uh, the a we a political we uh, that uh, that that some of us can decide to embody and some of us will might not decide to do so so maybe I'm picking up a conversation we've left years ago but I'm running 
the School of Architecture through the three lenses you, you produce today, like the School of Architecture as a wall that keeps the world out, maybe porous, maybe not, the School of Architecture as a corridor that takes a human being and, and transforms it into an architect, and that's irreversible once you've kind of gone through it, that's it. And as a place that you either need a key to get in or a key to get out. Um, and I just wonder what you think today about the School of Architecture and in, it, is it one of those three elements? Is it all? Is it none? What, and what, what should it be? Mm. Yeah, I don't really know because I almost think that uh, as a, I see the wall but maybe the corridor and the key are, or at least the corridor is maybe uh, uh, I think I was much more dumb about it and <laughs> looking at it in, in a very sort of material, physical uh, way. So I don't know. I mean, I I I feel my exp my 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 sort of relationship to the school of architecture is so widely unequal because I was a student in some of them. I was I taught in one of them, so that's not even that much. And I'm sort of any, every now and then I'm in setting foot in some of them, but uh, so I, I'm I'm not quite sure I'm able to articulate uh, to articulate um, something so powerful here, except saying that in general. But it's not it's not about school, it's not about school of architecture per se. It's just about uh, the, an, an education system in general, and is I think. Um, as much as much as we should try, uh, all of us with all our functions, uh, being administrative, teaching students, whatever, uh, we should all try to make it a, a sort of place where radical things can happen. I think I think it's also completely normal that because of the way those institutions exist, there's they tend to um, they tend to embody and reinforce the status quo and the dominant order. So. Um, I think we should we should place in schools as much as we can, as much as we are allowed, and as much as we are able to to give agency based on our uh, based on our roles. But there's only so much we can do, unfortunately. Hi. Um, hello. Um, I'm a great admirer of the magazine. I didn't know you were in charge of it. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, it's actually a really short question because when I studied here, somebody told me keys and signs are basically cop-out for bad architecture. So if you design architecture properly, you shouldn't need keys and you know signs of like the exit line over there. So my question is actually, do you consider this approach, well actually, don't take this the wrong way, but do you think yourself as a good architect? Well, <laughs> With all due respect. <laughs> no, no, yeah, but I mean, before before considering myself like a good or bad architect, I should consider myself like an architect, which I'm, I'm not even sure I do, even though I tend not to when I'm in front of architects, and then when there's no architect in the room, then I tend to <laughs> consider myself an architect, uh, if that makes sense. And I sort of like this, uh, I sort of like, I mean, beside, besides the sort of jokey aspect to it, I, I actually like... Uh, uh, Forcing architects to sort of get out of their get out of their little world, but also representing that world in other in other places. I mean, a little bit what I was saying earlier is that sometimes we we even we have skills we don't even know. Like the fact of perceiving the world in a spatial manner is for me like something something that we don't necessarily articulate, but that we definitely have. And you see, I, I say we, so apparently I'm, evidently I'm considering It's a room for there. bad architects. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but um, I, I mean, I, I, yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't know how to answer that. I, I think uh, I'm, I'm probably a bad architect for not being able to follow through the idea that uh, we should really, even though, even though our, once we say architecture is always violent, we should keep designing anyway, but we should, we should know what this violence is about and against, against what and against whom it is. Uh, being applied, but clearly, not having designed much uh, architectures that I'm able to show here makes me a better architect. But hopefully, we all aiming towards better. So, <laughs> you you might be nervous, uh, but I'm conflicted. Yeah, um, and I'm conflicted in your use of ethics and uh, the role that architects should take, and what is ethics in architecture, and how far does our power as architects go? Um, and it's. 
It's very interesting. I've been reading a lot about the ethics statements that either institutions like the AIA has or RIVA is actually trying to produce. Some of the most dangerous corporations around the world that do build high security prisons and torture centers and the refugee centers, they actually don't discriminate. They have very clear ethics codes and the standards of conduct. And so then the question goes, and last year we had a really heated discussion about should architects, right? The AIA was asking, should architects design spaces of torture? Obviously, no one should design a spaces of torture, mm. right? The answer is no one. Now, who ultimately designs a space of torture is never an architect, right? Because this is this could be a space of torture. Torture is not something that is designed, something else. So then the question goes in in really trying to understand where do we have some real agency, right? I think sometimes we confuse when we put the diagram of uh, uh, Jeremy Bentham, no, and, and the Panopticon prison. There's a very clear relationship, almost with the chaos, of what happens with the inhabitant and the observer, that architecture that is surveilling even without having those inhabitants, there is a power to that relationship that the space produces. But sometimes if a room, if a square, actually is going to be used to torture people, that's not something that we design. And so for me the question then goes in what, where do we position ourselves and when do we really stand up as a collective or when do we stand up as a discipline to say no versus when do we stand up and say yes. And we say yes because we as architects like to believe that we stand not for the quality of architecture. I, I love the example that you put on the wall, right? It's not that we actually say that the architecture is going to stand. It's could we think that we are dangerous enough, ethereal enough, that we might take a commission and that slowly we might be able to aim to dismantle the structures of power that might be at play at it. I'm trying to understand you know, that I really ultimately believe that as architects, we will never be able to decide if a place is a playground or a space of torture. But there are some things that we can create. There are spaces that we can design in a way in which things can happen differently. And so then the question is, where do we want to play the ethical ground? What are ethical questions for architects? And what are non-ethical questions for architects? Because a doctor will heal anyone who comes to his emergency room, even if he's a criminal or not, right? And so, in a certain way, the ethical code of conduct of a doctor is not to exercise the judgment if that person is having the right moral compass or not. It is to actually save that life. And for us, it's to produce a space not only for the function of the client, right, of the evil client, but it's to think that when that evil client might disappear, where an economic structure might change, we might ultimately be able to produce a city that is more equitable, that is more accessible, that is more free. So I'm trying to say, are we, are we putting ourselves outside of the game by saying we should not be designing offices, schools, brothels, motels, because all of them are corrupted, because all of them are ethically wrong. And I agree with you. But if we remove ourselves from all the things that are ethically wrong, that I would say is 99% of the things, what are the things that we should be doing? Mm -hmm. and, and so I'm giving you back now as an architect to an architect, who I don't know if I'm an architect, but where do we actually draw the line of the ethics that we should be engaging with? And the ones that actually is for all of us as citizens to engage with. And I think that's for me a very important question. Ethics for architects versus ethics for citizens. And I think that sometimes we conflate that and we confuse that. So but help me with that. Yeah, but I think also ethics is, um, uh, I mean, what I was saying, like what about banks, what about factories, what about mm -hmm. schools? It was within this, uh, within this tactic that uh, um, uh, the architects, planners, designers for social responsibility have came up with to take a pledge, but personally, my uh, my sort of um, and and I, I think we should always be articulating tactics and strategy. And so, w tactics are something that very much is operative at a at a punctual, both spatial and temporal level. And strategy is maybe more the, the big picture. And and my strategy is not really to get involved much with ethics and to get much more involved in politics, which. Uh, 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 which would also mean in that case that, um, and something that I, I, I probably felt felt to uh, to demonstrate is that for me architecture is not this neutral thing that can be used as a playground or as a, as torture site, but uh, is in itself 
in itself has already something of the torture site uh, contained that, that can be activated even more so in given political uh, conditions, which is not to say that architecture is this sort of like almighty, uh, uh, almighty thing either that uh, has uh, is always containing uh, uh, bodies and bodies cannot do anything against it or anything. But I think I'm um, I'm I'm very much trying to 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 pull away from from the idea that we can we can we can do the good or we can do the bad and and architecture is just a tool to go from one, one side to the other. I, I think architecture has always a certain violence. And my manifesto for architecture would be for designing architecture, in that case, to really, f to really um, not use the skills to show something or anything, but very much to design architecture, is to not shy away from this violence, but just be, being able to reorient it towards, uh, toward that, w that we are fighting. So that, ma that makes it indeed like a, a sort of reactionary uh, 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 practice, but that's that's the one that I sort of uh, want to articulate and think see, think of it as useful to articulate. Um, thanks, Leopold. That was a very interesting lecture. Um, I just want to maybe uh, make one sort of suggestion with regards to the manifesto, and then afterwards ask you a question. Um, the first one, um, l I guess, <coughs> looks to the idea of um, the architect as a, as a worker, and how um, many of the issues that you raised in your manifesto about the architect being complicit in um, these sort of uh, dubious practices around the world uh, comes down to the fact that uh, many of the architects, and I'm not talking about the star architects, but the everyday, you know, assistants and the part twos and the just graduated are also having to put dinner on a table, pay bills, and um, a way to perhaps counter this, and maybe this can be an addition to your manifesto, and actually I think every manifesto should contain this idea, and that is a, a universal and unconditional basic income. Uh, what, sorry? And a basic income, ah, yeah. um, because I think only then, when you have your sort of means of survival, your basic needs guaranteed, can you not only sit down but stand up and say no. Um, so that's my first part of the question, um, and I sort of encourage everyone to look into and go talk to all your friends about the idea of a basic income, because uh, it, uh, yeah, it's a good one. Second question. Uh, is should we abolish the corridor? Short and sweet. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Once again, I think I'm I'm not I'm not abolishing the wall. Even uh, it's it's just it's just let's let's know let's know what this uh, uh, typology does, how, how it operates, what it crystallizes, and then and then let's. Uh, Let's uh, let's embrace let's let's embrace that and let's make it useful in the sort of political vision that we that we have. That, by the way, if your political vision is very much in line with uh, with uh, the dominant order, you have nothing to think about. You just need to design it in sort of in a very natural way, and it will it will. I mean, 99% chances it will it will very much serve the dominant order. So it is very much the having to think about what it does. Is very much to be able to reorient it against uh, uh, other bodies, other things that uh, than the one that are usually targeted by those. Uh, so that's that's my take on architecture, whether it's wall, roof, uh, corridors, uh, all those all those uh, inventions of, and um, and so um, yeah, and and for the basic income, I don't know. We should talk later. <laughs> I don't know. Perhaps I'm not sure. <laughs> Yeah, hello. Are you someone? Is it me? Yes, it is. Okay. <laughs> uh, oh, first of all, I'm going to say that I'm against ethics. I think the function of ethics is to replace politics. Um, ethics is kind of a 
as far as I'm concerned, a category that has been obsolete in social sciences since the mid-19th century. And you should just kind of get it over with and assume, accept that it has been replaced by the concept of ideology. Um, so I don't think ethics is useful as a category to examine the architectural position. Um, the useful way of looking at it, and I think your metaphor of the wall is fine here, um, is that there are material conflicts in society and um, architecture plays a part uh, in the articulation of them, usually on the side of those who can pay, um, who issue commands. So, I mean, I, I think we're all generally in agreement here. I just want to make a kind of a Marxist, um, uh, kind of put my Marxist foot on the ground against ethics. I hate that word. Um, <clears throat> I really, I, I'm really sympathetic with a lot of what you presented. I also have a lot of problems with a lot of it. Um, I feel that there's a kind of an excessive fetishization of form still going on. Uh, and uh, too much like architecturalization of politics, if we frame it within the Benjaminian duality as opposed to kind of a politicization of architecture. I know it's a di difficult to see where one ends and the other begins sometimes, but my feeling is that there's too much form here. Um, the, uh, I, I could make the exact opposite argument about the corridor, um, using it for example, the kind of the historical example of uh, distribution uh, systems in housing uh, over the 20th century and specifically how there's kind of a, the bourgeois fear of social housing is really kind of condensed on the um, space which is the distribution gallery, which is kind of a producer of working class community. Um, and the historical development of, and replacement of social housing with private development tends towards the replacement of the gallery or the corridor with uh, vertical distribution, a kind of a proliferation of the vertical distribution, obviously tending towards the technological device of the lift that takes the middle class person directly from the garage to the apartment. Um, so I think f kind of f looking through form itself is not enough. And I think it is also kind of an answer to what Ava was uh, uh, kind of raising. And I also sympathize with Ava's possession here. Uh, I think that um, the fetishization of architectural form is on the negative side is also not good. Um, and I do believe that uh, our opposition to power structures is not through architectural agency, it's through political agency. I don't even believe in architectural agency as a, kind of, as a form of political agency. And just to finalize, You've made the explicit point that the two sides of the wall are not the same. Um, with your, again, metaphor of the, uh, the bus stop on the, in the rain. It's one is being protected from the other. Then why are you a phenambulist? Why, why are you walking the tightrope? Isn't that like precisely the position of not picking a side? Is it, is it, is it kind of petty bourgeois liberal affectation going on there? You done? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Sorry. Um, no, but I mean, I agree with what's, what most of what you said, except that I, I've never, I'm not, I, I really don't think I've used a single metaphor in this entire <laughs> presentation, so. It's a good question. Yeah. Uh, we have two more questions, yeah. so that's okay. There's one in the back and then I'll... Oh, yeah. Um, a lot of people in this crowd probably know I'm obsessed with cattle. Okay. <laughs> and um, kind of like I discovered a little bit more about why I am. So the Temple Grandin's pen that you showed, I'm also obsessed with that. And what I like about that pen is that it's a structure that then kind of, how to say, influences the body of the cattle, no? It is a structure to, to kind of project a certain emotion and a certain feeling within the animal as a means of domesticating and constructing an animal and constructing a body, essentially. And what I recently discovered, why I'm so obsessed with cattle and cattle pens, is I discovered whoop, that um, I've descended from terrorists, essentially, in Malaysia in the 1950s. And that there were a, se a series 
of fences and walls constructed around the entire population to protect us from these terrorists. So what I've noticed, right, is that this was a period of psychological warfare in Malaysia in the 1950s, essentially. And the wall that was constructed has entered the body of these people. And this is a war, this, these walls are mostly forgotten by uh, kind of contextual history today. So the wall has entered the body of the person as a psychological construct, as a means of domesticating a generation. And it, I have inherited this wall inside me. It's not a question. It's just a comment. <laughs> no, it's, it's fascinating. Thank you very much. And I, I, actually, uh, I actually know someone who works exactly on, on, on this period of time. In, in please, uh, please, please, put me in contact uh, with him. Yeah, and the British, the British state of emergency over there. So. Yeah, um, yeah. But perhaps some, just because you offered me to, to add a little bit more on Temple Grandin, I think I, that was not really part of what I was trying to say, so I did not say it. But what I find fascinating in, his, in her schemes is just whether uh, the animal should have a chance to realize what it's about to happen. Uh, 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 it, should we give the ch a chance uh, to the animal, even if it's never going to work? I mean, that's pretty much what bullfighting is about, right? It's like, let's give a chance, even though we're, we're killing it at the end, or not. I mean, and I, and I don't have any answer to these questions, but I, I, find, I find the shortcuts that consist in saying that she invented like a humane, uh, and I, and, and you don't like the word ethics, I don't like the word humane. Uh, 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 um, a, more, a more humane way of, 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 of working the slaughterhouses, which from a, from a very sort of immediate point of view is true, but I think there, there's something there that is quite interesting to, to dig a little bit more as well. Yeah, and when you mention the word humane, it's great that you mentioned it because the Malayan emergency in these kind of detention camps were marketed as the humane form of warfare at the time, and it's the best case and is known today as the best case scenario for humane warfare. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, uh, when you talk about prisons, that is something that is in our existing political and economic context. And when you look at like emerging alternatives like restorative justice or truth and reconciliation, these are, these are indigenous practices that you know are, are kind of uh, just need a space for circles to be formed. But I'm just wondering if you've looked at like what is the role of architecture with supporting alternatives like restorative justice, restorative practices, truth and reconciliation, or if you really need to wait for larger cultural, political, and economic will before the, the architect can start to step in. Yeah, that's a great question. I, I haven't really looked at it, and my, my sort of most poignant uh, example of, uh, of this sort of True alternative. When you say alternative, I was afraid because I, I thought that was the usual, like uh, you know, uh, a bracelet or whatever, uh, carceral technology. But indeed, exactly the truth or reconciliation or any kind of form of radical. I mean, how crazy is truth and reconciliation, right? It's like uh, as a within a society to to decide to go to go through that way of dealing with uh, uh, dealing with. Um, with trauma and and for me my, the most the most sort of poignant example comes into my uh, research on on Kanaki New Caledonia and in particular a particular uh, um, events that happened in 1998 were 10 years after uh, one Kanak indigenous Kanak uh, activist killed the number one and number two uh, 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 people from the provisional government of Kanaki. Um, assassinated because they, he, they had just signed the accords with the, with the French as sort of peace, peace accords that ended the insurrection and that definitely did not end colonialism. And so it took 10 years for the, the tribe of the, the tribe of the, both tribes of the two people who were assassinated and the tribe of the, of, of the killer who also was killed uh, right after uh, to come to uh, a ceremonial, I mean, what kind of people call la coutume, uh, uh, of, of reconciliation. And it is incredibly ritualized. It is as emotionally charged as, uh, as it should be, so to speak. I mean, meaning it is sincere. It's not just a performativity of reconciliation. And the only problem with all, with all that is that it's happening, it was happening uh, outside in a, in a prairie, so its architecture was very much absent from, from this. So indeed, I don't have any sort of 
uh, input on, on what, what a space of the kind would look like, but it is, it is indeed a very, a very important and interesting question uh, that I hope to have more answers for. <laughs> Um, on that note, um, I think uh, Leopold earlier gave a seminar to Marina History and Critical Thinking students. After that, he wrote this manifesto he presented tonight <laughs> and then um, did the lecture and answered all our questions. So um, I think he probably deserves a drink. <laughs> so um, I hope all of you will join us upstairs in the front members room um, to continue the conversation. And thank you very much, Leopold. Yeah, thank you to many of you.